Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of Earth Explained. I am your host, Ryan McCutcheon, and I am streaming to you pre-recorded every Sunday at midnight. Um, uh, now, in all seriousness, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you're getting settled in after the first week, and uh, I hope all of my Blackboard announcements weren't too confusing for you last week as I was kind of getting up to speed. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, but without further ado, um, this week I'm going to discuss Chapter 2, Plate Tectonics, with all of you. So a little context for plate tectonics um, and the idea of plate tectonics. So prior to the 1960s, most geologists actually believed that the positions of the continents and ocean basins were fixed. They thought they hadn't moved since Earth was created. Um, there was some geologic evidence at the time that suggested that maybe the continents had once been in a location different from where they are now, but no one could actually believe that the continents had moved without any mechanism to explain why they would move, right? The idea of a continent just moving across the surface of the Earth doesn't make much sense unless um, you know why that might happen. So sort of rewinding a little bit, um, the first time that anyone really suggested that the continents might move was in 1915, and that was when a gentleman named Alfred Wegener proposed the idea of continental drift, or the continental drift hypothesis. He published this idea in The Origin of Continents and Oceans. And in that book, he wrote that a supercontinent consisting of all of Earth's land masses once existed. He called this supercontinent Pangaea, and proposed that it began breaking apart about 200 million years ago. Well, it turned out that Alfred Wegener was right, and um, he wasn't so crazy after all. Um, so at the time when Alfred published his book, the idea was scoffed at um, by geologists. So first of all, Alfred was an atmospheric scientist and not a geologist. Um, and secondly, and, and most importantly, he didn't propose any mechanism um, that made any scientific sense to explain why continents would move across the face of the Earth. But as you can see in this figure, he was correct, um, and the continents do move. So in the bottom of this figure here, you can see his drawing of what he thought Pangaea looked like. Um, which is the supercontinent that existed 200 million years ago. And then at the top of this figure here, you can see what geologists think that Pangaea looks like today, um, or looked like 200 million years ago as of today. But as you can see, um, I would say Alfred actually did a pretty good job um, considering the information that he had at his disposal in 1915. So I know to some of you, the idea of the continents moving, it probably sounds totally insane. So continents are pretty huge and they have vast oceans in between them. How could they just be moving around the surface of the earth? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a few more pieces of evidence uh, that were used by Alfred Wegener to explain why continents might move and what gave him this idea. So one um, piece of evidence is the continental jigsaw puzzle. So in this uh, figure in the upper right here, you can see that um, a good example of the continental jigsaw puzzle is the puzzle piece of South America and Africa. And in fact, um, if you include the continental shelf, then South America fits next to Africa pretty much perfectly. And this can be seen with a number of continents around the world. Another piece of evidence is fossil evidence. Um, so identical fossils were found on different continents that today, you know, exist a thousand miles apart from one another. And usually um, 
in modern times, we don't find the same species of land dwelling animals um, and plants that far away from one another. There might be some that are within the same family, but not the same exact species. And this also suggested that maybe some of the continents were connected and there was a land bridge between different continents at some point in the past. A couple other pieces of evidence that Alfred used um, are rock types and geologic features. So you can see in this figure on um, the left here, what you know, North America, South America, Africa, and Europe look like today in terms of their location on Earth. And then in subset B, you can see what these continents looked like when Pangaea existed. And that there is all, all one mountain belt. So for example, um, the Appalachian Mountains were part of the same mountain belt as the Caledonian Mountains in Europe. Um, it's just that these continents have been separated by hundreds and hundreds of miles um, since Pangaea existed. One other piece of evidence is uh, evidence of ancient climates. So ice ages um, and ice sheets leave marks, um, pretty distinguishable marks on Earth's surface. And there's evidence that the southern portions of South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia all um, had ice sheets on them during the last ice age. And, you know, some of these, like for example, Africa exists, some of the places where there were ice sheets are near the equator today. <laughs> and um, the ice sheets didn't make it the whole way to the equator during the last ice age. So that suggests that Africa used to exist in a different place than it does now. And as you, as you can see, when Pangaea existed, um, South America, Africa, India, and Australia were all much closer to the South Pole. Well, if Alfred had all of these lines of evidence to suggest that continents moved, why didn't anyone believe him? Um, well, as I, I sort of alluded to earlier, he never came up with a good mechanism for why the continents moved. He was a meteorologist, not a geologist. So a lot of the geologists sort of scoffed at him and mocked his ideas. Um, and as far as the mechanism for why the continents moved, he incorrectly suggested that the gravitational forces of the moon and sun were capable of moving the continents. And today we know that's just not true. He also incorrectly suggested that continents broke through the oceanic crust as they moved across the surface of the earth. Um, and I, I can't blame him for this, I suppose. We didn't have a great map of the, the seafloor at that time, but after we did get some good maps of the seafloor, we could see that this was also clearly just not true. However, speaking of the seafloor, um, following World War II, we really did start to get a good idea for what the seafloor looked like. Um, this happened after World War II because World War II was sort of the advent of sonar and all of a sudden we could map the seafloor uh, pretty effectively. So um, those using sonar to map the seafloor uh, for, you know, um, war purposes actually they found that the oceanic ridge system winds through all of the major oceans. Um, the oceanic ridge being in sort of an uplifted ridge on the ocean floor. And they also found that there was very little sediment on the ocean floors relative to Earth's age of 4.56 billion years. One would expect that sediment eroding off of the continents as a result of being moved by water or wind would build up 
to the point on the ocean floors where there would just be a ton of sediment down there, but there wasn't. And in fact, they were able to use <clears throat> um, the, uh, the known rate of the radioactive decay of uranium to date the oceanic crust. And they never found any oceanic crust that was older than 180 million years old. Well, if Earth is 4.56 billion years old, you know, why isn't there any oceanic crust that's older than 180 million years? We'll get to that in a minute, but altogether, these discoveries guided scientists to the concept of seafloor spreading. This is a figure that I used um, last week in the introduction to geology lecture. And in the middle of all of the world's major oceans, you can see these mid-ocean ridges that I was just discussing. For example, in between North America and um, Eurasia and Africa here, and South America and Africa, this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, and this is one of the areas on Earth where seafloor spreading occurs. So seafloor spreading explained a mechanism for plate tectonics or a potential cause of the movement of continents over the surface of the earth. Um, so volcanic activity at mid-ocean ridges like the mid-Atlantic ridge that I just showed you add new crusts to the edges of lithospheric plates. And then continents are carried along those plates. Alternatively, crust is destroyed along other plate edges known as subduction zones, where one lithospheric plate subducts beneath another lithospheric plate. So Lithospheric plate or lithospheric plates are both created and destroyed. Um, one thing that doesn't change is Earth doesn't just get larger over time or shrink over time. The amount of plate that is destroyed is roughly equal to the amount of plate that is created. If you remember a moment ago when I told you that we are able to um, date or assign an age to the oceanic crust. And I told you that we didn't find any oceanic crust that was older than 180 million years old. Well, this figure shows you around the world, um, everywhere that we have data on the oceanic crust, how old the oceanic crust is. What's interesting about these oceanic ridges um, with vol volcanic activity that creates new lithospheric uh, plate material is that everywhere along the oceanic ridges you can see that the age of the crust is very young. This scale over here on the right is in millions of years, so everywhere that's dark red is approximately 0 to 10 million years old. And then as you move further away from these oceanic ridges, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge for example, you can see that the oceanic crust gets older and older until a maximum of about 180 million years of age. Now, the reason why the crust is generally not older than 180 million years old is because that's long enough for that oceanic crust to usually um, subduct beneath continental crust and get recycled into the mantle and therefore it's, you know, no longer on the Earth's surface. So if you look at Pangaea, um, we'll look at the modern reconstruction of Pangaea here in the upper right. And then you look at these oceanic ridges, you can see where, for example, here, South America got pushed away from Africa, which is why they are no longer connected in this way, by the creation of new oceanic crust along this mid-Atlantic ridge. Similarly, between North America and Africa, North America and Africa here, you can see the same thing, the mid-Atlantic ridge pushed 
these continents away from one another. Um, and this appears to be the mechanism for the movement of continents all around the world. Well, I'm sure you still have a few more questions. So we now know that lithospheric plates are moved around Earth's surface, at least partially as a result of seafloor spreading at the mid-ocean ridges. However, what causes the volcanic activity and what causes the creation of new lithosphere at the mid-ocean ridges? And then why would any lithospheric plate subduct beneath another lithospheric plate and get recycled back into the mantle? Well, to answer that, we need to revisit a couple of terms from last week's lecture. Uh, remember that the lithosphere is Earth's strong, rigid, brittle outer layer. Alternatively, the asthenosphere is a hotter, weaker region of the mantle that lies just beneath the lithosphere. Because of these differences in physical properties, the asthenosphere being closer to a liquid and softer and hotter than the lithosphere, the, lith the lithosphere is effectively detached from the asthenosphere. This allows the lithospheric plates to effectively float on top of the, of the asthenosphere. You can think of the lithospheric plates as a sailboat and the asthenosphere as the open sea. So this diagram shows you know, the difference between the lithosphere, which could be oceanic lithosphere or continental lithosphere, and the asthenosphere where the lithosphere lies above the asthenosphere and the asthenosphere is this weak layer where rocks exist near their melting temperatures. So it's more fluid. Okay, so maybe plate tectonics is real. <laughs> um, I guess I probably alluded to that a few times throughout the course of this lecture so far. So this diagram that you can see right here shows Earth's major uh, tectonic plates or lithospheric plates. And you can see that the lithosphere is broken into approximately two dozen smaller sections. Those are the lithospheric plates that I've been speaking about. And these plates are constantly in motion, usually moving from two to five centimeters per year, although some move slower than that and some move up to 15 centimeters per year on average. This might not seem like a lot, it's very slow movement in terms of time from the perspective of a human lifetime. But as I discussed a little bit in last week's lecture, the reason why these continents are able to move so far is because they have millions of years to move. So for example, from Pangaea until present is 200 million years, which if you have the continents moving a few centimeters per year, that adds up quickly. So if all of these massive lithospheric plates, remember the Earth is broken up into only about 24 of them, are just moving around Earth's surface all willy-nilly, well, what do you think is happening at these plate boundaries? That is a lot of force being exerted, and it's a lot of friction. And any time that one plate subducts beneath another plate, that plate melts and that creates magma or a lot of heat and energy. So what's actually happening at these plate boundaries is, as you can see from this map, if you remember where the plate boundaries are, there are a ton of earthquakes and there is a lot of volcanic activity that is focused right along the plate boundaries. And we'll get to talk about earthquakes and volcanoes and the exact causes for these phenomenon later in this class. Um, most of you have probably felt an earthquake recently, maybe some of you for the first time in your lives. Uh, there have been some larger than normal earthquakes in Idaho recently, so we'll definitely talk about that. But what's actually causing these earthquakes and volcanic eruptions other than the friction and the heat from these plates moving around as I described? Well, it's really three different types of plate boundaries or three different ways that lithospheric plates interact with one another. 
the first type, are called divergent plate boundaries or constructive margins. And a good example of these are mid-ocean ridges, where you have two, two lithospheric plates that are moving apart from one another, while new lithosphere is being created along the mid-ocean ridge. Another good example of divergent plate boundaries are continental rifts, and these are spreading centers within a continent itself, where two different plates within a continent are moving apart from one another, and new lithosphere is being created at the continental rift or spreading center itself. The second type of plate boundary are convergent plate boundaries or destructive, destructive margins. And these are where plates collide and often an ocean trench forms where the lithosphere is being subducted into the mantle beneath the other plate that it is colliding with. I'll get more into the details of that in a minute. The last type of plate boundaries are called transform plate boundaries. And these are where plates simply slide past one another and no lithosphere is created or destroyed. This diagram shows good examples of these different types of plate boundaries. So first, you can see the divergent plate boundary here at this mid-ocean ridge where there is a slab of lithosphere to the right or a lithospheric plate to the right of the, of the mid-ocean ridge and a lithospheric plate to the left of the mid-ocean ridge. And those plates are moving apart from one another as, these, as shown by these arrows while new lithosphere is being created at the mid-ocean ridge itself. A convergent plate boundary is shown here where the oceanic lithosphere is colliding with this continent and the oceanic lithosphere is subducting beneath this continental lithosphere and it is causing melting which forms um, <clears throat> mountains and volcanoes, uh, and we'll talk about some good examples of these later. Uh, there's another example of a divergent plate boundary over here at the Continental Rift Valley. And then we don't have an example of a transform plate boundary in this figure, but we do have an example of a transform fault. The only difference between a plate boundary and a fault is that a fault is a fracture within a plate rather than a plate boundary itself. But the way in which the, the lithospheric material on other side of the fault moves relative to the other side of the fault is the same way in which two different plates would move relative to one another in a transform, uh, a transform plate boundary. So here you can see that on this side, of this transform fault, the oceanic lithosphere is moving to the left relative to on this side of this fault. So that's an example of a transform fault. Now to zoom into the three different types of plate boundaries to see just exactly how they shape our world. First, divergent plate boundaries or constructive margins. These are areas where two lithospheric plates move apart from one another. The most common example are oceanic ridges. Oceanic ridges are where seafloor spreading occurs, which as we now know is partially, at least partially responsible for the movement of the continents. In this case, the plate on one side of the oceanic ridge moves away. In, sorry, plates on either side of the oceanic ridge move away from one another and at the oceanic ridge itself, new material is created from upwelling of mantle material and volcanic activity. These divergent plate boundaries can also occur within the continental lithosphere, creating new continental material. So this figure shows an example of a divergent plate boundary at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge between North America and Africa and Europe, where plates on either side of the spreading center um, or the divergent plate boundary, you might call it, are moving apart from one another and partial melting of the material from deeper in the earth causes it to upwell at the spreading center, creating new oceanic crust. 
this figure shows an example of a divergent plate boundary um, within a continent. So uh, this shows kind of the shaping of the lithosphere over time. So first here, you can see that continental rifting is occurring as a result of upwelling of hot uh, material from deeper within the earth in the mantle. And then the stretching from that causes the brittle crust to break into large blocks that sink, and this generates a rift valley. Continue, continued spreading um, at this divergent plate boundary generates a long and narrow sea similar to the present day Red Sea, if you're interested in seeing a, a divergent plate boundary in this stage of the process. And then eventually, as these plates continue to move apart from one another, an expansive deep ocean basin might form. Iceland is one of the best places in the world to study oceanic divergent plate boundaries. This is because Iceland is actually an expression of the mid-Atlantic ridge above sea level, so you don't have to dive deep into the ocean to explore what's going on. Uh, the reason why Iceland is above sea level where the rest of the mid-Atlantic ridge is below sea level is because there's some extra upwelling of material from the mantle where Iceland exists relative to the amount of upwelling that's occurring along the rest of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I've actually visited Iceland um, for a few weeks to explore the geology, and I'd love to share that with any of you that have further questions. But um, I have a mobile field trip to Iceland that's recorded here. It's not me, unfortunately. I didn't think to record a mobile field trip while I was there. Um, but I encourage you to take a moment to watch it. There's going to be some terminology in the video that might be a little bit above your head at this point in the class. But it's still a really interesting video, and I think that you can learn some useful things from it. So please enjoy. Moving on to conversion plate boundaries or destructive margins. I like to think of convergent plate boundaries as areas where the lithosphere is destroyed rather than created. One type of convergent plate boundary is oceanic continental convergent plate boundaries. These are where the denser oceanic slab of the lithosphere sinks into the asthenosphere beneath the less dense continental slab of the lithosphere. When this happens, part of the denser oceanic slab melts as it sinks into the asthenosphere, and this causes magma uh, to be created, and pockets of this magma develop and rise towards the Earth's surface. And this forms continental volcanic arcs. Examples of continental, vo var <laughs> sorry, continental volcanic arcs uh, include the Sierra Nevada range and the Cascade range uh, just to the west of here. And this is the reason why there are so many volcanoes in this area and this is the reason why this area is mountainous is because of the upwelling of magma caused by the subduction of the Juan de Fuca oceanic plate beneath the North American continental plate. And um, so Mount Hood is a good example of a volcano that was created as a result of the Juan de Fuca plate subducting beneath the North, the North American plate. And here you can see a number of the other rather prominent volcanoes that are created from this, um, including Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier. Um, one of the main reasons that partial melting of the subducting oceanic lithosphere occurs is because a bunch of water from the ocean actually infiltrates into the oceanic lithosphere while it's beneath the ocean. Um, and when that water is driven out from that subducting oceanic lithosphere as a, a result of pressure and heat, it actually lowers the melting point of the overlying continental lithosphere, causing mountain melting and creating these uh, these volcanoes and all of this volcanic activity that we're very well aware of here. So now is uh, an opportunity for 
I'm calling it an in-class exercise, even though we're all working remotely. I'd like you to take a minute to try to answer these questions as sort of a thought experiment. Um, and then I'll answer the questions later during the lecture. But I really encourage you to do this because it is sort of teaching you to think critically and to think um, about geology in a scientific way. So we know that convergent plate boundaries exist where two lithospheric plates collide into one another. And we now know what happens when an oceanic plate collides with a continental plate. I just explained that in the last slide. Um, you know, it's what created the Cascade Range, for example. But I want you to answer what you think happens when a continental plate collides with another continental plate, and what you think happens when an oceanic plate collides with another oceanic plate. Please take a minute to try to answer these questions. Okay, now that you've surely taken the time to answer those questions, um, I'm going to hopefully elaborate upon the answers that you've already come up with. So, at an oceanic, oceanic plate boundary, where a slab of oceanic plate is colliding with another slab of oceanic plate, typically what happens is that one of the oceanic plates subducts beneath the other oceanic plate. And this forms a volcanic island arc. It's basically the same concept as what happens when an oceanic plate subducts beneath a continental uh, plate. The only difference is that the volcanic activity actually occurs out in the open ocean because you're dealing with two oceanic plates. Now, you might, you might be thinking to yourself, Okay, well, I thought that oceanic plates were basically made of basalt. So why would one plate subduct beneath another one? Aren't they most likely the same density? If they collided, why wouldn't they just create a mountain range, for example? Well, the reason why is because despite, despite the fact that they're similar in chemical composition, older oceanic plate is colder in temperature because it's further away from the um, mid-ocean ridge where there's upwelling of magma. And because it's colder, that actually makes it denser. So whichever plate is older where the two oceanic plates are converging, that one subducts beneath the other oceanic plate and then experiences partial melting and creates a volcanic island arc. A good example of a volcanic island arc is the Aleutian Islands, actually um, up near Alaska, or as part of Alaska. And here in this figure on the right, you can see an example of uh, this oceanic plate to the south, subducting beneath this section of oceanic plate to the north, and this creates a volcanic island arc known as the Aleutian Islands. Now moving on to the second question I asked you in the in-class exercise, what happens when continental lithosphere collides with other continental lithosphere? Well, in this case, neither piece of continental lithosphere subducts beneath the other one. There's not a large enough difference in density between one piece of continental lithosphere and another piece of continental lithosphere to cause that type of subduction to happen. One example of a continental continental convergent plate boundary in our world is um, India and Asia. So India collided with Asia about 10 million years ago. At one point, there was an ocean basin between India and Asia, and that ocean basin has completely subducted beneath Asia, uh, which did create a continental volcanic arc. But as of today, India is actively continuing to collide with Asia, which makes it a continental continental convergent plate boundary. And the result of this is just uplift the 
continental plate has nowhere to go but up because neither continental plate is willing to subduct beneath the other one. And this is actually what created the Himalayas, which, as many of you know, is a mountain range that contains some of the tallest mountains in the world, including the very tallest mountain in the world, which you can see here to the right, which is Mount Everest. I encourage you to watch the, sorry I skipped this, the animation on the last slide that shows sort of the history of India coming to collide with Asia. And also uh, I encourage you to watch this video, which is um, convergent plate boundaries in review. So we'll discuss continental, continental, convergent plate boundaries, oceanic, continental, convergent plate boundaries, and oceanic, oceanic convergent plate boundaries. The last type of plate boundaries are called transform plate boundaries. And these are where two plates slide past one another and no lithosphere is created nor destroyed. The most common example of transform plate boundaries exists along oceanic ridges, where there are breaks in the oceanic crust known as fracture zones, and the crust on either side of the fracture zone slides past one another. A few transform faults also cut through continental crust. Um, prominent examples of this include the San Andreas Fault in California and the Alpine Fault in New Zealand. So this figure here shows an example of all of the transform faults along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So not only is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge a divergent plate boundary, but there are transform faults dissecting that divergent plate boundary all along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So in this top figure here, you can see one section of oceanic plate moving to the left relative to the section beneath it, moving to the right, and so on and so on. What's really interesting is that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge's zigzag pattern um, that you can see in this figure here actually roughly reflects the shape of the rifting zone which resulted in the breakup of Pangaea. So even though you have 200 million years of this divergent plate boundary that is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and all these transform faults where oceanic crust is sliding past another section of oceanic crust, the shape is generally similar to the shape of the divergent plate boundary that resulted in the breakup of Pangaea 200 million years ago. Uh, so this photograph here on the right is just an example photograph of movement along the San Andreas Fault. Um, Many of you may have heard of the massive earthquake that was above a magnitude 9 that occurred in the San Francisco area in 1906. And, you know, I sort of discussed previously that normally uh, lithospheric plates move a few centimeters per year. But sometimes when those plates are sliding past one another, they get stuck and they can get stuck for a long period of time. And as they're continuing to try to slide past one another, but they're, but they're stuck for a long time, more pressure and energy builds up. And in this 1906 earthquake, you can see this poor farmer's fence uh, is now six feet apart from this other section of this farmer's fence because there was actually a slip of approximately six feet along the San Andreas Fault that caused this earthquake. And um, if it helps you remember uh, transform faults any better or transform plate boundaries any better, um, you might think of transformers and how they transform from some of their parts or, you know, like plates from one location to another, but none of the transformer is actually created nor destroyed during that process. So now we understand a little bit about all the different types of plate boundaries, what happens at those plate boundaries and how it shapes the world in which we live. However, let's um, talk about a few more geologic concepts to further test the plate tectonics model and talk about some things that don't happen necessarily at the plate boundaries themselves as a result of the underlying mechanisms that power um, 
spreading centers and other plate tectonic activities. So one of these phenomenon are hot spots and mantle plumes. I sort of talked about a mantle plume earlier when I was talking about Iceland and why Iceland exists above sea level, whereas the rest of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge exists below sea, well, sea level. Well, what a mantle plume is, is basically just a cylindrically shaped upwelling of hot rock, and in, in some cases magma where that hot rock melts. The expression of uh, on the surface of the earth of a mantle plume, if the mantle plume makes it the whole way to the surface of the earth, is called a hot spot, which is usually an area of volcanic activity or volcanism. One example of a hot spot is Hawaii, and another example of a hot spot is Yellowstone. As a plate moves over a hot spot or a mantle plume expressing itself at the earth's surface, a chain of volcanoes known as a hot spot track is built. The age of each volcano in this case indicates how much time has passed since the volcano was over the mantle plume. For example, you can see this in the Hawaiian island chain. So this figure here is showing the Hawaiian island chain and the age of all the different Hawaiian islands. As you can see, the most current or the youngest Hawaiian island is the island of Hawaii itself, and it's only 0 0.7 million years old. However, as you move back in time, you can see that Maui is closer to a million years old, Molokai is closer to a million and a half years old, Oahu is over two million years old, and Kauai, or Kaui is almost 4 million years old to up to 5.6 million years old. And as a, as a result of being able to get a date on the age of the rocks on these islands and to see where these islands exist, we can actually track the direction in which the Pacific plate has been moving and how fast it's been moving over time. So in this uh, little subset of the figure here that shows Earth, you can see the current island of Hawaii, and then you can see uh, the way in which the uh, Pacific Plate has moved. So if Hawaii is the youngest and these islands over here are the oldest, then in fact the plate must have been moving in this direction. I hope that makes sense to everyone. And this is a map of Earth with all of the other examples of hotspots or mantle plumes, which again are not at plate boundaries, but still have a significant amount of volcanic activity because they are hot rock from the mantle, some of which melts that's expressing itself at the Earth's surface. So another way to test the plate tectonics model is through paleomagnetism. So basaltic rocks contain magnetite, which is a mineral that's rich in iron. And when basalt cools below the Curie point, which is the point at which lava or magma um, cools to the point where it can actually crystallize into minerals that form rocks, the magnetite aligns towards the position of the North Pole. The magnetite is then sort of frozen in a position that indicates the position of the North Pole at the time that the rock solidified. And this is referred to as paleomagnetism. And so if you actually study the direction that magnetite crystals point, um, and then you study that over time by dating those rocks, it would appear to one who doesn't know that the continents have moved over time that, in fact, the magnetic poles have moved. And this is why this phenomenon is called apparent polar wandering. But only because we're aware of the theory of plate tectonics and the continents have moved do we know that it's not the magnetic poles that have wandered over time, it's actually the continents themselves. So one other way that the plate tectonics model can be tested is by looking at magnetic reversals and seafloor spreading. So during a magnetic reversal, Earth's magnetic field reverses polarity. Um, so 
if you were using a compass, for example, if there was a magnetic reversal that had occurred, you're, you would think that you were going north, but you would actually be going south. Or if you thought you were going south, you would actually be going north. Um, and this occurs due to convection of magnetic materials in magma inside Earth, but that's not really part of this lecture. Um, and the magnetic time scale, or looking at how uh, the magnetic field has reversed over time, shows the sequence of shifts in the polarity of Earth's magnetic field, which can be determined by looking at magnetite, again, um, in basalt in oceanic crust. Um, and so this figure shows all of the times that the magnetic field has reversed over time as recorded in oceanic crust. So here you can see at, um, at the actual oceanic ridge, we have normal polarity or today, today's polarity. And then as you move out, sometimes polarity reverses and then goes back to normal and then reverses and then goes back to normal. And this is a way to show the age of the um, oceanic crust or lithosphere that's being created at these oceanic ridges and how it gets older as it moves away from the, the mid-ocean ridge. And so how do we actually measure plate motion? Or, you know, I've told you that plates typically move from two to five centimeters per year. Some of them move up to 15, some of them less than two. How do we actually measure that? I think that you probably have some ideas based off of what I've talked about so far. But we measure that by knowing the age of the seafloor, which we can date using radioactive isotopes and a known rate of decay, uranium, for example, looking at uranium um, within the basalt on the seafloor. And then we know the age of the seafloor, and then we know the distance of that seafloor from the spreading center or from the mid-oceanic ridge. And from that, an average rate of plate motion can be calculated because you're just looking at a distance per unit time. And using that information, here is a modern map of our understanding of the age of the oceanic lithosphere. Um, so this is a scale in millions of years. So all the areas that are red, which are typically near the mid-oceanic mid ridges, are very young in age. And all the ages which are darker are much older in age. Um, or, I mean, you can look at the colors on the time scale, I guess. Not all of the older ages are darker. Sorry about that. And this gives us sort of, you know, now we have not only the direction of plate motion by doing things like looking at the Hawaiian um, hotspot and the movement of that hotspot over time, but we also have the rate of motion of the plates. So with the direction and the rate of motion of all of Earth's lithospheric plates, we can start to get a picture for, you know, not only what Earth has looked like in the past, but, but also what Earth's surface might look like in the future in terms of where our lithospheric plates are and where our continents are. So, now that we have a good ways to estimate the direction in which tectonic plates are moving and the rate at which tectonic plates are moving in those directions, we can get a pretty good picture of how our surface has changed over time. So for example, starting 200 million years ago with the supercontinent Pangaea that we discussed at the beginning of this lecture, we can see that over time, North America and Eurasia started to move away from one another, and South America and Africa started to move away from one another. Australia started to move away from Antarctica, and India started to move away from Antarctica and towards Eurasia. Pretty crazy, right? But that brings us to the present and what our continents look like on our surface today. <clears throat> 
But knowing the rate of movement of tectonic plates and the direction that they're moving, even though we know these things change, it still gives us the ability to estimate what Earth might look like tomorrow or 50 million years from now. So in fact, this is a geologist's projection of what Earth might look like 50 million years from now. And as you can see, there are actually some pretty major changes. Um, one example being Africa and Eurasia are much more connected now, and there's a whole new mountain range here. Another example being that Australia is much closer to Eurasia than it was before, and much closer to the equator than it was before. Africa is mostly north of the equator versus before it straddled the equator more. North America and South America are disconnected. And the west coast of North America looks completely different. So you can see that over the course of geologic time, Earth's surface actually changes pretty rapidly in terms of geologic time, just not during the course of our lifetime. So I have one more in-class exercise for you. Um, we now have ample evidence that lithospheric plates move. Hopefully you all are on board with that at this point. And if you're not, I would, I would love to have a conversation with you about it. Um, but why do they move? We know that seafloor spreading is one driver of plate motion, but what causes seafloor spreading in the first place? Use your understanding of the layers of the earth and physical properties of those layers and plate tectonics to answer this question. Uh, please take a few minutes. Again, this I am going to answer this question, but it's more to teach you all to think like geologists. And I'd be curious to talk to you about any of your answers um, anytime. So plate motion is actually driven by Earth's heat. Um, it's the driving force through convection. So this convection occurs in the mantle where warm, buoyant rocks rise and cool, dense rocks sink. And this is the underlying driving force of plate tectonics. This is the reason why material from the mantle upwells at divergent plate boundaries, for example. And several models exist for how exactly convection moves the plates. Um, one model is called slab pool, and this is where the descending oceanic crust that's subducting beneath continental crust or other oceanic crust pulls the rest of that plate down into the mantle with it. Another model is called ridge push, where the elevated ridge system at oceanic ridges pushes the plate as a result of gravity because the elevation at the oceanic ridge is higher than it is at the convergent plate boundaries where the plate is older, and so gravity pushes the plate down into the mantle. In reality, the reason why plates move is probably a combination of these two models. Um, we're pretty certain of that at this point. So another way to think of convection or a good way to think of convection, um, in my opinion, is to just think about a heat lamp. You have a heat source, which is the light bulb. In this case, the heat source would be the magma at the center of the earth, or it's just hotter the further you go towards the core of the earth in general. So the heat source is anywhere closer to the center of the earth. And when material gets heated up by the light bulb or magma in Earth, it rises because it's less dense than the surrounding material because of its hotter temperature. However, in the lava lamp, there's cooling wax at the top. And then as the material cools, it becomes denser than the surrounding material and it sinks. And this same sort of convection happens within Earth where here you can see the mantle next to the outer core, and you can see this cool, dense material sinking into the mantle. And then as the material makes its way down towards the outer core where it's very hot, it heats up and it becomes less dense, and then it upwells towards the surface, creating these, these mid-oceanic ridges, for example.
And this figure here shows, you know, examples of ridge push and slab pull, as I discussed before, as the ways in which plate tectonics or movement of the plates are driven as a result of convection within the earth. So convection drives uh, mantle material towards the surface, which creates these mid-oceanic ridges. And then the ridge push and the slab pull drive colder, denser material back down into the mantle and the cycle starts and, and continues over and over again as convection. That's a wrap. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, next week we will discuss matters and mineral and how plate tectonics shape the matters and mineral that lie beneath our feet. Talk to you then.